<clears throat> hey y'all, Irix guy here, and I'm just firing up my chat so I can see what everyone is uh, is saying here. Now today's live show, and I plan to make this a uh, a weekly, if not even more frequent, event. Today's live show is all about the Phantom Three, and in particular the new Phantom Three intelligent flight modes that were released as part of a firmware update on Monday, Monday of this week. So let me get into chat here because I see a lot of people trickling in and I need to uh, need to be able to view the, the live comments here. So go ahead and, you know, any questions you have pertaining to Phantom 3, any experiences you've had with the Phantom 3, whether they're positive or negative. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a real, a real chat. So there's no, okay, there we go. I got everything perfected here. Does the video and the audio, is the audio okay? And does the video look okay? Okay, so I'm just going to start by going few, going through rather a few things pertaining to the um, to the Phantom Three, and today's focus is going to be the uh, the firmware update. So, for starters, there's one thing I wanted to point out, and and you can find my video. I I went through everything step by step on 400 400 or below .com where I stepped through the entire firmware update procedure. I actually had a camera rolling while I was updating the firmware to the latest version. And uh, one thing that, <clears throat> that a lot of people have commented about, and even myself, when I was updating it, I questioned, well, how about the controller? Do I need to update the controller? And with this particular firmware update, uh, the one that was released on Monday of this week, it did not require a controller update, but I did have to update the Phantom 3, and I did have to... Uh, I did have to update the the app, the DJI Go app, and I use I use iPhone six plus, and then I also use the uh, the iPod Touch. And actually, I've gotten to where I much prefer this iPod Touch because I can. Uh, it's smaller, as you can see here from a uh, from a form factor perspective. It's a lot smaller than the. Uh, than the iPhone 6 Plus, and that's actually for me, it's it's several. It provides several advantages. Uh, one of those advantages being the um, the heat. I haven't had an issue with this overheating. Now, my iPhone 6 Plus, I have encountered an issue with it overheating, and it wasn't um, it, it wasn't catastrophic because I was able to obviously I was able to to maintain control of the craft uh, by way of um, by way of the controller. Those people are just going to have to wait. Somebody's calling me. <laughs> um, so I was able to maintain, retain control of the craft by way of the controller, so it wasn't an issue, but it's still less than optimal when your device that, that you're using to, uh, to manipulate the various Phantom 3 settings, et cetera, while it flies, and especially if you're using the, the new intelligent flight modes, you need that controller to be able to uh, to take advantage of that functionality. And that brings up an interesting point. Uh, several people have been chatting about the Phantom 3 intelligent flight modes and whether or not GPS is required. And I can tell you so far, uh, from my experience in the field, the point of interest I was able to do with this iPod Touch, the follow me, I was unable to do with iPod Touch. So I had to use my iPhone 6 Plus with the cellular connection to be able to do follow me. Uh, waypoints I've not yet tested. As I'd mentioned earlier, there was a uh, there was a tropical depression and it uh, created some some undesirable weather. So I wasn't able to get out in the uh, in the field and test the waypoints yet. Oh, we got a bunch of people coming in. Hello, everyone. And by the way, I see your comments live. So type your comments and we can uh, we can chat. I've got a probably a few seconds of of delay here so when I see your comment uh, great question why can't YouTube live stream 4k well <clears throat> that's a great question and that's that's something that uh, that I'm sure YouTube will will probably have to address soon because you know as you know as everyone that's watching if you're not aware I film everything in 4k now uh, this obviously is not 4k 
I'm just using a, a webcam. And uh, by the way, if you want to check out how I do my live shows, I've got a page and I've, I've broken it all down on SnagBear, snagbear.com. And uh, on snagbear.com, you can find how I do all of this, um, how I do all of this live broadcasting. But I bet 4K will probably come. I bet we're, if, if YouTube's going to do the 4K live, I would assume it's probably going to be after we're already to 8K and beyond and where that's a kind of lesser technology because it will, it will consume a lot of bandwidth. And not everyone, uh, from a viewership perspective, very few, I mean, what's the, the number's increasing because the prices of the sets are dropping, but the large percent of, percentage of the viewership is likely still uh, HD TV. So you're, you know, they probably don't have a big, but back to the, uh, you know, let me get a glass of water here. I'll, I'll be right back over. So yeah, back to the topic of the show, the the drones, and I know this is what we're. Uh, oh, we got a fan from Argentina. Daggum, that's awesome. Uh, let's see, and a comment in here. Hi, Rick Sky, loving the new firmware. Just a little disappointed. Waypoints don't work with our iPod Mini. Also, when in F mode, it is impossible to see if the camera is recording. You know, that's interesting about the uh, the F mode. And that's the waypoint thing. And I, and I bet your experience with the uh, with the iPod mini, I'm assuming you don't have cellular connection on it. It's probably uh, probably the iPad mini <clears throat> and the iPod touch. If I had to guess, it's, it's probably probably the same type behavior. Now, I have heard some people say that they were able to do the waypoints without a cellular device. Now, I haven't tested waypoints yet. It'll be interesting to see if our experiences are the same because uh, so far when I tested uh, point of interest and follow me, follow me did not work, uh, but point of interest did. So uh, for follow me, I had to use my cellular enabled uh, iPhone 6 Plus. What have you done with your Parrot Bebop drone? Sold it? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, and and it's, I wanted to love the Parrot Bebop. The Parrot Bebop, the thing that I like most about it was the size. And not just the size, but the weight. And I know a lot of people had, uh, a lot of people had, had criticized the Parrot Bebop because of the construction. Oh, it's a, you know, it's a piece of styrofoam and I'm spending X amount of dollars to get this. And what I what I discovered with the Bebop is that, in theory, it was a, it was a good tool. It was a good size. It, you know, I could even fold it up in this backpack right here. If you if you check my post on uh, on on four hundred or below, you'll you'll find this backpack. But I was able to put the Bebop in this along with some other camera gear. So it was very, from a travel perspective, the Bebop for me was optimal. But the problem with the Bebop is that the video was uh, it was software stabilized, so I didn't have the gimbal on it like I do with the with well now the Phantom Three Pro, and I had in my previous Phantom Two and Phantom Two Vision Plus. So the only drone that I own right now is the Phantom Three Professional. So to to conclude what I was saying about the Bebop, it just wasn't for me. The video quality was subpar. It wasn't anywhere close to real 1080p HD. Even if it had been stable, the video quality just wasn't as good, in my opinion, as a uh, as a Phantom 2 Vision Plus or a uh, Phantom 2 with a GoPro. And then when you got the big controller, and I know there were aftermarket hacks that people used to to use small devices like the NVIDIA Shield, et cetera, and that made the portability still decent. But then again, you're dealing with a hacked craft. I mean, why couldn't Parrot have just released a small controller to go with a small drone? The Sky Control, I understand what they were doing. They were trying to get the shock and all. It's like, oh man, that guy must know what he's doing. He's got this big thing around his neck with a with a big antenna on the front. From a visual perspective, it looked impressive, but from a uh, 
from a practicality perspective, in my opinion, it, it was just a failure because video quality, photo quality, subpar, portability wasn't there when you when you added the sky controller. And you really couldn't, it didn't matter which device you were using. And I, I tried my best to love the Bebop, but whether it was a tablet or a smartphone, it just wasn't a good flight experience using it without a sky controller. So anyway, enough of the Bebop. Yeah, the Bebop's long and gone. Actually, I had the regular Bebop and I also had the Bebop with sky controller bundle and they're both gone. Uh, and then there's another comment in here. Okay. Oh yeah, the carbon fiber props. The carbon fiber props I love. Uh, the reason that, well, number one, I like them, and this sounds kind of corny, but I like them because they have this stripe, and when they spin, it makes, you know, when, when this is in motion, it looks like a little, it looks like a circle there. So that's a corny reason to like these, and you can get them in other color combinations, too. I've got them all linked on uh, 400orbelow.com. Uh, but beyond the visual, what I think visually looks better about these versus the standard, uh, props that come with a Phantom 3 is that, well, they just, I mean, they, they look neater, but also they're more rigid. So when I hover with the carbon props versus the props that came with the Phantom 3, these white plastic ones, I, from my experience, and, and correct me if, if you've had a different experience, but when I hover with the carbon ones versus the, uh, the factory props that come with it, it seems to me like the hover is more precise. You know, it doesn't it doesn't fluctuate as much. Maybe that's just in my mind. But also, I've noticed that they seem to be faster, and that would seem to make sense since it is a more rigid propeller. Anything that's more rigid, uh, for example, with a boat with an aluminum propeller versus a stainless steel propeller, you're going to get more performance out of a stainless steel just because it doesn't flex as much as a uh, as an aluminum propeller does. So for that reason, it makes sense. Now, both of these, and, and I don't know how well you can see it within this video, this uh, this webcam is of, of pretty good quality, but uh, the inside of the nipples here, these little prop nipples, this seems to be, well, and a lot of people comment about this, the, one that, the ones that come with a Phantom 3 Pro, it's almost like a rubbery type plastic on the inside. And with these carbon props, it's kind of hard to tell if it's a plasticky or a metal just by looking at it or feeling it. But with, with both of these props, I haven't had any problems. And with that said, I like third-party accessories, but one third-party accessory that, that I've always been reluctant to try is a third-party prop. So these are all, these are all DJI props. And let's see, next question here. We've got a ton of questions. Um, I wonder if iMovie will work with 4K soon, not new, not the new iPhone 6S, now that the new iPhone 6S has 4K. And actually, I think I, that's a great question. And I, I haven't pondered the same simply because I use Final Cut Pro, and it makes sense from Apple's perspective because iMovie is their bundled product, which which I love, and I love the, the ease of drag and drop and editing within iMovie, but I think they may have held out the 4K export capabilities just to sell more Final Cut Pro, but now that, now that with the 6S and the 6S Plus having 4K and 4K editing capabilities, and not to mention on the device itself, that was something I was reading on Apple's website last night, uh, that from the device itself, that it says you can upload to YouTube in 4K from an iPhone 6S or an iPhone 6 Plus. So if they, it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't add that to iMovie as part of a future update because now 4K for Apple device is the norm, uh, whereas previously it was 1080p. So that, that's, that's interesting. We'll see, uh, we'll see what Apple does with that. Uh, next comment, where do you live? Film a lot of your videos. Well, I'm kind of a mobile dude. I'm a, uh, there's, there's really no real place I, I like to get all like to get all over. I've uh, uh, you may have seen my videos where uh, where I'd mentioned that that I've gone full full time 
social media. So the beauty of that is that I don't have a set office. I don't have set hours. I, I, I go everywhere. Most of the time I'm in the Caribbean, in the uh, south of the United States. So that's, that's the place where I like to spend most of my time. And it's just a, uh, it's a great environment because the, from my experience, the people in the Caribbean are some of the most friendly people in the world. And it's, it's an affordable place to explore. And obviously the scenery there, the scenery there, in my opinion, is better than, than a lot of the scenery in anywhere in the world. And I, I like, uh, I like cold weather environments too, but most of the time, uh, most of the time I am in the Caribbean. And if someone says, yep, it is possible to use point of interest without GPS. And I, I can, I can confirm that because it's, uh, it works with iPod touch, uh, which I don't think this has a GPS. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. And this is a very affordable device too, which is great. Um, and it's talking about point of interest. And one of the cool things with the point of interest, and it'll be funny to see how this pans out as more of a start to use and master these new intelligent flight modes for the Phantom 3. Uh, but what I really liked about the point of interest was just the ease of setting it up. And it's kind of daunting at first, but the way that I've, uh, and I'm going to practice this if the weather holds out, but just think of a, a point on the ground here, such as this battery, you know, fly your drone over the, uh, fly your drone over that point. And then once you're there, you set up your point of interest after it's already over that point, then you define your radius. So it'll go out whatever, uh, whatever radius you specify. And then it's doing a 360 degree orbit at that radius. You may have seen my flight test. Uh, one thing that I've got to work on now with the orbit is the positioning of the camera. So I think the optimal way to do it is to go up directly above the point of interest, set the radius. And then once the radius is set, using the gimbal wheel and the controller, tilt the camera so that it has the, the optimal effect. So maybe you're trying to get, you're trying to focus on the, the highest part of the object. You know, maybe you would, you would be at a higher altitude for that. Or maybe you kind of want to get a 360 kind of, not, at, not above the object, but not, not towards, not closer to the ground either. So maybe you would hover where part of the object was above you and then position the camera accordingly. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that one can do, and I think, uh, what what are y'all's thoughts out of the new features, the point of interest, the waypoint, the follow me, which feature do you think is the best, why do you think it's the best, and then why do you think you'll use it more than more than the other features, or maybe you don't like the, the, uh, the intelligent flight modes at all, maybe they're of no value to you. And someone says, I don't understand, does it follow the controller or the phone? For the follow me, um, I'm and that that's that's where I have I really haven't uh, really haven't dug too deeply into how that works, but I, I do know that the phone is as I mentioned earlier the phone's involved because the phone has a cellular connection, the uh, iPod Touch definitely does not. So I would I don't, I don't know if it's um, if it's pulling GPS data from the phone to the controller to let the phantom know where the controller is, but wouldn't the wouldn't the phantom already know where the controller is? And and the reason I say that is that if uh, if you're flying with iPod Touch, Return Home still works. So if it's doing that, then why wouldn't Follow Me work? So it's a great question. It's kind of weird. Uh, the next drone I buy will definitely be a DJI. Uh, that's uh, I again. There's a lot of brands of drones out there. And I think that uh, based upon my personal experience from Phantom 1, Phantom 2, Phantom 2 Vision Plus, and now the Phantom 3 Professional, I love this form factor. And it's, it's, to me, it's, it's proven to be, a, uh, to be a reliable platform. With that said, I think there's a lot of tricks in the bag that, uh, that GoPro, if GoPro executes well, the GoPro drone in 2016 may be something to, uh, to start to drool over. <laughs> Um, so I'm excited about the GoPro drone without having any of the specs yet. It's hard to speculate uh, beyond the fact that GoPro has historically seemed to execute well, except for, in my opinion, the new GoPro session camera, you know, the little cube. They did a few things right with the new GoPro session camera, and it shows where GoPro's heading as a camera company. Uh, they made it smaller. They made it to where you don't have to use the 
waterproof housing, and they also made it to where uh, to where it's just a lighter device, and that would be something that would be better suitable for for aerial applications, et cetera. Where they failed with the GoPro Session, it does not have a user changeable battery, and it doesn't do 4K. It tops out at 1080p. So it'll be interesting to see if GoPro, when they release this drone in 2016, if they also release a 4K equivalent of that Session camera. Because I do like the new Session size, and I don't like to use waterproof housing, and I like how it's uh, uh, it, it's just the, the form factor. I mean, it's, it's better. And you can use the same mounts, most of the same GoPro mounts, which is great. So you don't have to repurchase all of those mounts that you probably already have. Uh, did you ever have to update controller? After update Monday, I did some flight test and all was well. Recharged the battery and took the P3 Pro out to the lake and the controller, and the controller required update. Weird. If my controller updated, the app never acknowledged it. And the last time I flew was day before yesterday. So that would have been, because yesterday it was raining. Uh, so that would have been, uh, let's see, today's Thursday. So the last time I flew, excuse me, I got the hiccups, was Tuesday. And at that point in time, I didn't see an app update. And that brings up an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, question about the batteries. A lot of people have said you've got to update the batteries. Have you updated the Phantom batteries? And how did you do that? Because obviously, when you do the firmware update, there's one battery in the Phantom 3. But what if you have two or more batteries? I've got two batteries. Do you need to update them all? What are, What's everyone's thoughts on that? I haven't. And and I've flown it. And uh, you know, I haven't run into any problems. Not saying that's the optimal thing to do. Uh, great question. Uh, Someone says they haven't updated the firmware at all yet. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> uh, given the track record with DJI's firmware, that's probably a smart move because as we all know, if, if we had, uh, if we were around from, from day one of Phantom 3, uh, we knew that some of the first Phantom 3 updates were horrendous and they would introduce problems where you had to, uh, where you had to really troubleshoot and then further optimize the flight dynamics of that craft. And, and fortunately, at least for me and hopefully for many, uh, the uh, the IMU calibration seemed to work magic. So when you had the, probably all of us have encountered the tilted horizon issue where it was filming and the, instead of the horizon being level like it should be, it was, it was canted. And that was, uh, that was something that an IMU calibration was able to fix for most of us. Uh, someone says, what is happening at the DJI Inspiration? It's in approximately eight hours from now. I, I honestly have no idea what, do, do y'all have any idea what's coming? Uh, there's a few things I hope are not coming. And, and the thing I hope's not coming is an Inspire 2. Uh, I'm personally not a fan of the, of the Inspire. No offense if you are. I just feel it's too big. It's too heavy. It's, it's just too cumbersome to travel with. And if, if I was in the wheelhouse of DJI, what I would be doing is I would be taking this right here, like they've already done by incorporating Lightbridge into it. I would be taking this Phantom 3 platform I would be finding ways to further enhance the experience. So, uh, for example, maybe even shrink this down a little bit more so it's more portable, or maybe make some sort of uh, of of modification where if you're in the field, you know, maybe you're going on a on a trip to fly, and you've got a big truck or a big van, and size isn't an issue, or maybe you're going in a canoe or a kayak come up with ways where you can make it a more modular design so you can shrink it down depending upon your flying location. And obviously you would probably get the best experience if you were flying with the big kahuna. But in times where portability is a concern, be able to, you know, use a modular design and shrink it down and take, take it with you and still get that experience. Maybe not as good of, an, of, a, of a user experience, but still be able to capture the same quality 4K or better video. Uh, here's another, uh, see, tons of questions. Uh, my controller would not update this time. Is there an update for the controller? Uh, as, as I had mentioned, and, and actually another, another fan in the chat, the live chat right now said that theirs updated. I can say mine did not. And uh, you can watch uh, from the update that I performed on Labor Day, which was Monday. If you watch my video on 400orbelow.com, uh, that's my website. You'll see from start to finish where I where I filmed the entire firmware update process. And there, 
when I tried to do the controller update, it didn't update. So there, there was no update, at least for mine. And this is the Phantom 3 Professional. Someone says, I've been told uh, that carbon fiber props make turbulence. Did you feel that? Well, the, I mean, the props are more, um, as I'd mentioned earlier, the carbon props, are, they're more rigid. Uh, did I notice turbulence? I did not. I've landed it on the front of a boat. I've landed it in the bed of a pickup truck. I've landed it in a wide open space. And I haven't noticed, uh, haven't noticed any problems with, uh, it, it hasn't degraded the flight dynamics for me in any way. If anything, as I mentioned earlier, the thing I notice is faster acceleration and then also a more stable hover. And that's not the result of my other Phantom 3 propellers being damaged in any way because that they're perfectly flawless because I've always flown with, uh, with the quick disconnect prop guards that I use here. There's, there's been a couple of times where I didn't attach these. And that was out over open ocean, and that was simply because I only have two batteries, and I wanted to uh, further extend uh, my battery life for that flying location. Uh, someone said Final Cut Pro 10 is better. Final Cut Pro 10, and whether you're an Apple user or not, and, and we'll provide everyone with a with a brief history here. I'm not and granted all my computers now are Apple, but I don't consider myself to be an Apple fanboy. Uh, what's brought me to the Apple camp, and I used to build computers, I used to build Linux servers, I used to build, uh, you know, but way back in the day, MS-DOS computers with the with the earlier versions of Windows, Windows 3.11 for work groups, all that old school stuff, and free BSD. So, I, you know, I've grown up in the in the nerd realm and, and building my own computers and upgrading them, and but when it comes to when it comes to video and photo, I have not found a platform that's better than Apple. And the, the thing that, that most impressed me about the, uh, uh, the Final Cut Pro 10 is that just like iMovie, it was a natural progression, a drag and drop type workflow. And then Final Cut Pro was a drag and drop workflow with more advanced features. So if you're doing chroma keying, like my green screen right here, uh, you can you can uh, better dial in the effects if you've got little spots there's there's ways to fill holes check out my green screen tutorials on that but it just gives you a lot more pro features and as we had talked about earlier at the time of posting this it allows you to export in 4k which at the time of posting this iMovie does not so yeah it's it's a good program I uh, talking about the ND filters uh, you can find all of those on 400 or below.com and I use uh, personally what I use is this it's an ND this is the ND4 uh, the one that's part of the screw on set because there's screw on filters and then I've also got slip on filters a lot of people that had the factory uh, when, when you get the Phantom 3 the 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 filter on it you can't really tell there's a filter there because it's not larger than the uh, than the than the Phantom 3 camera, but a lot of people are unable to screw it off. So for that type scenario, the slip on filters like you'll find on 400 or below.com, those may be the best option. But if you can screw them off, uh, the three pack of screw on filters that I have on 400 or below, like I'm using here, I've really uh, really enjoyed it, and I've stuck with the ND4 most of the time. And ND8's great, but only when it's super sunny. The ND4 for me has been kind of the best all around and the polarizer. I really haven't used that much because it, um, even though it made the color saturation better, what I can do with this, I can film with the ND4 and then go into final cut pro 10 and go into color correction, saturation and adjust the saturation levels. And I can get the best of both worlds. So I get the benefits of the, of the smoother looking video that the ND4 helps to produce. And then I get the color saturation ability in post-production. Minimum altitude for orbit from what I've seen is five meters. Yeah, that's interesting. They set in these, these altitudes. So you got to be at a certain altitude before you can do stuff. Maybe that's because of, I mean, are they, do they think it's going to fluctuate up and down by a few feet or what? It's kind of weird. Uh, someone says, follow me follows the device, not the RC. The RC does not have GPS. Okay, that makes sense.
Will follow me work with controller inside of your car? Uh, it's actually a great question because part of uh, I'm going to get to the field and do the uh, you know, do the waypoint test, which I haven't done yet because of the weather. But I'm actually going to chase a truck around, a, obviously a safe and responsible wide open location, and we'll put that to the test. Did you see where Google created with GoPro, where it films 360? Um, actually, there and, and there's a consumer consumer grade 360 camera you can get. Check snagbear.com, uh, which is my website, and it's on there. It's a Kodak camera, and it's uh, it, it's it's not 4K or anything, but it'll do 360. And then basically, at a high level, you stitch it together before you upload it to YouTube. And then when you're watching in YouTube with Chrome or other compatible browser, you can pan around in a, in a spherical view, uh, just like you would with um, just like you would with Street View. Uh, check out on my channel. Just search for 360 degree video, and you'll find some where I'm doing RC cars, and then also one with a cat, and you can pan around and look look at everything. It's kind of neat. Uh, someone says they think there's going to be a new camera for the Inspire One, and you know what? That's a good uh, <laughs> that's a good prediction because they're they're going to try to. I tell you, when they've released such a such a stellar platform, they're going to try everything they can to uh, to to bring life back to that Inspire One. But that's a that's a good uh, good theory. Yeah, I hope they don't announce the Phantom Four already either, because in my opinion, the Phantom Three. From a um, if you're if you're using this to have fun and capture videos like I do, then 4K is at least now it's best in class. I mean, yeah, sure. If they came out with an 8K, that could be beneficial if you're zooming in and out in post. But for aerial applications, is that really something that that you would take advantage of that much? I mean, maybe you would, but I think it would be it may would create a dizzying type effect if if that was uh, that was present. Someone says maybe a Phantom 3.5. <laughs> Let's see. Someone says, do you not miss the larger screen of the iPhone 6 Plus? iPod touch is a lot smaller. Let me get something here for a visual comparison. I'll be right back over. So since uh, since I fly a line of sight, I uh, obviously I'm using the screen to to enter the uh, the intelligent flight modes, uh, change settings, etc. So I'm not actually using it to fly. So for that reason, when I look at the screen of my iPod Touch, I'm just looking at it as a quick visual acknowledgement that everything is lined up. And as you can see here, I'm used to looking at the camcorder screen, which this is my primary studio camcorder. And you can see the iPod Touch is a little bit larger than it. So for my purposes, the iPod Touch is perfect for the Phantom 3, but, you know, as we had mentioned earlier, follow me feature does not work with iPod Touch, but everything else has worked with iPod Touch for me. Waypoints to be tested, haven't tested that yet. Yeah, this shirt would be cool with the green screen. <laughs> uh, someone saying 4K, 360 degree. They're saying 4K, 360 degree. And I think uh, if, if that's what DJI releases, then that's that would better position them to compete with GoPro because without a doubt, we know that when GoPro drone comes out in 2016, I don't know if it's going to have 360 degree camera on it right out the door, 
but obviously that's the way that GoPros, the GoPro cameras evolving. And that's the way that, uh, that, that I'm assuming they would probably do the, uh, uh, do the drone as well. You know, add that 360 glare reduction device. Okay. And you can find this check 400 or below.com and go to DJI Phantom three. And it's one of the last items listed there, but basically this is great because as you can see here, it's very thin. And then you take it out in the field and you, uh, it's got Velcro there. It's got Velcro there. And now you've got a sun hood. And just to demonstrate with the controller real quickly, I'll show you how to do this. So I, I piece it together in the field and take it out of my case. I put my, get my Phantom 3 controller slide this in there it's it's etched out to uh to fit over those little finger things down there and then i put my ipod touch in here or my iphone 6 plus whichever one i want to use the iphone 6 plus does fit kind of tightly but it does fit so i put that in there and then i simply tuck my cable through And plug it in so for me this is perfect because it it does block the Sun and actually from my experience with these retina displays like the iPod touch has I don't really need a Sun shield but it definitely makes seeing those that level of detail within the app a lot better and one mistake you may make with this if you do pick one of these up too is that see this thing um, and, and I did this in a in a previous video but it's uh, it's got two colors, and obviously the, the black is going to best uh, darken the area. But something I did within one video, or actually a few of my videos, if you if you've seen the Phantom Three uh, new features field test, you'll see some of them where I had the black on the outside, and that's easy to do. So if you get this, be sure for optimal results. You know, be sure when you Velcro it together after you take it out of your case. To have the black on the inside like that again take take apart put together just so simple just fold it up and then slide it back in the case tony grant tv what's up Tons of comments. Yeah, had someone saying 360 on the drone would have half of it blocked out. That's true to some degree because if you're if you're looking at uh, if you've got like a, I'm trying to think of something in here I've got to visualize better visualize this with. So imagine half of an Easter egg on top of this. You know, like the little plastic eggs. In that scenario, if this was the drone, you would have you would have half a sphere. So if you if you were filming in 360, you'd be able to look straight out, you'd be able to look straight forward, straight backwards, and then you'd also be able to look up and around in a half sphere. So if you wanted to look up that way, you could. If you wanted to look straight out, you could. If you wanted to look straight out and up, but what you could not do is look below the drone unless the drone had two hash spheres. So you had a spherical camera on the top, spherical camera on the bottom, then you would be dealing with the same scenario here. You could, you could pan the camera around when you're watching it in, uh, on YouTube in multiple directions. But if you stitched it, the only gap you would have would be the, mild, the minor gap, and maybe not at all if the camera is positioned optimally, where the actual camera meets the surface of the drone on the top and where the camera meets the surface of the drone on the bottom. So I think that's what we're going to see. I think, I think we're going to see, uh, I think we're going to see that type of, excuse me, had Taco Bell for, uh, <laughs> had that for lunch and that's, that stuff. Ooh, it's good. Like it, but it's giving me the hiccups. So what else is aside from um, 
Uh, will the sunshade work on larger iPad Air 2? Well, let me show you the size of this in relation to iPhone 6 Plus. Uh, this particular one will not, but shoot me a message. Uh, shoot me a message, by the way, my Facebook fan page, facebook.com forward slash irixguy, and I'll send, you to, I'll send you links to some sunshades that should work uh, with the iPad, with the various versions of the iPad. iPad mini, also the iPad Air. But see, this right here is, uh, you can see with my iPhone 6 Plus in its case, I've got an aftermarket case on the iPhone. This is about the largest device with this particular sunshade uh, that you'd be able to use. Now, there is the possibility, if you wanted to kind of retrofit it in a way, uh, what you could do is just pop the sides out when it's on your, when it's on your controller and then just kind of let them flop down. Obviously, that's not going to be optimal. It's not going to shield the sun like it would if it was uh, if it was Velcroed together like that. But if it was popped out, you could stick a larger object in there and still have the coverage on the top, but obviously the sides wouldn't be latched down. Haven't had lunch yet. That's cool. Yeah, I need to, I need to, that's part of the thing with this YouTube. I'm going to start eating healthier than eating a bunch of uh, unhealthy stuff, but. So let's see, what else, you know, we're, we're covering, oh, this thing right here, if you haven't checked this out, this little anemometer, this is one of the coolest gadgets that I picked up. It's, uh, you can measure the wind speed. You've probably seen it around my neck in my, in my most recent videos. But it's just a cool way to pull it out, you know, point it into the wind, and and get the uh, get an accurate uh, reading of the of the wind speed. And I measure everything in knots, but you can do uh, you can do other forms of of measurement as well. So that's that's a cool uh, a cool drone accessory. Uh, I got here late, so don't know if you went over it. But what do you think of the iPad Pro editing 4K video? in the iMovie app. Um, actually, and, and I'll, I'll give you my unfiltered feedback in regards to the iPad Pro. So if people if people were unable to watch the Apple Live event yesterday, Apple, obviously they unveiled the 6S and the 6S Plus phones that, that have a 4K camera, but they also unveiled this new iPad Professional. So it, it kind of looks like they're going it's a larger iPad, and, they, and then they've also got an optional keyboard that you can get for it. And then they've also got an optional Apple, what are they called, Apple Pen or Apple Pencil or something along those lines. And it's a, it's a sophisticated stylus that if you're using it as an art tablet, if you tilt it sideways, it's going to, it behaves very closely to how a, uh, to how a pen would if you were, if you were an artist. So I think it's, uh, I think it is, something that could be good for 4k video editing now obviously if you're doing a large quantity of 4k videos with multiple cameras it may not be as optimal as going with uh say like an imac with retina display uh, like i use or a mac pro because it may slow you down you know having that slower mobile processor but i think uh yeah 99 apple pencil that's funny it's funny how they're how they're pricing that stuff because if you look at the price of the iPad Pro, look at the iPad Pro, look at the hundred dollar pencil, look at the optional keyboard. I mean, you're getting in, you're easily in iMac territory. And keep in mind, a 4K video, and this is something that a lot of people incorrectly assume. A lot of people assume that to edit 4K, that you got to be able to watch 4K, and that's not the case. I edit 4K all the time on this Mac. Uh, this is the MacBook Pro. 13 inch with retina the current model uh, MacBook Pro with retina and although I can't watch 4k videos in it in 4k I can edit 4k videos and then when I send them to YouTube and watch them on a smart TV or my iMac with retina 5k display I can see it in full 4k so you don't have to and that's another thing a lot of people say with with 4k the video looks blurry and it's going to look blurry unless you've exported with 4k settings and you're watching it on a uh, 4K monitor, you know, smart TV or a 4K computer monitor. So it's, 
I don't think I would go after the iPad Pro as a 4K editing solution. Uh, the only reason I would go after the iPad Pro for me personally would be to uh, to create um, to create awesome thumbnails that look like I drew them on a piece of paper because you're using that that Apple Pencil on uh, on a um, on a on a virtual surface, which is neat. Now, with that in mind, if you're looking for a way to have that pen in hand effect, uh, check out uh, check out this tablet I use. I've got a video on my channel. It's a Wacom or Wacom. I don't know how to pronounce it. W a c o m. Uh, it's very affordable, and you can find it on my snagbear.com website. And it's what I use. Now, obviously, with it, you don't see when you look down at it, you don't see the image like you would with the iPad Pro. But if your if your hand eye coordination is is sufficient enough what you can do is just look at your computer monitor while you're drawing or writing with that and it it's uh it's actually not hard to get accustomed to it's kind of like using a mouse but i would admit that uh that being able to see the the immediate results right in front of where the pencil is would be optimal so for that reason i think the ipad pro would have a good uh would have some good convenient stuff. And also the stuff they were showing about Microsoft office in the iPad pro. I thought that was pretty funny. I also thought it was funny that, that uh, Microsoft was actually at an Apple launch event. <laughs> uh, that was quite interesting. So uh, I don't know. I, I think for editing, if I was going to go with editing on a budget today, what I would do is I would get an, I would get a Mac mini. You know, that's a little small cube where you bring your own monitor, mouse and keyboard. I would get that. And then I would start with iMovie, figure out if, if I'm sufficient enough with editing with iMovie. And then I might would go to App Store and buy, uh, buy the Final Cut Pro 10 upgrade as well as Compressor. And Compressor is important because if you do the workflow that I do for 4K, you edit in Final Cut Pro, then you send your video project to Compressor. Basically what Compressor does is shrink it down and enables it to, uh, to be... Uh, to be in that 4k format but a smaller file size because if you don't compress and you upload to youtube it could be the difference between a few gigabytes versus potentially 20 30 40 gigabytes and then that's not just that's not uh optimal for most people that that have a standard internet connection having to upload a file size that large it just wouldn't be wouldn't be realistic uh good afternoon got a new new fan joining here uh what other questions does everyone have i know we got off on a uh, on an apple tangent uh, what else what else uh, experiences you've had with the Phantom 3 uh, questions you have about the Phantom 3 anything for that matter I mean it doesn't have to be uh, Phantom 3 is obviously the primary focus for this particular show today uh, but I plan to make this a weekly if not more frequent event uh, where we can all just get together and chat live what do y'all think y'all think this is a good format I mean is it is it better than watching a video that was recorded and and commenting in the uh, within the comment sections. What what do you think about the live show? Does the audio sound good? Does the video is the video acceptable? Or Why does an iPad Pro have an option of one terabyte storage? Well, and actually, this is just my assumption. Uh, one of the things that Apple unveiled uh, as part of the uh, of the live event yesterday, if you're able to watch it, um, something they did was they increased, and I don't know, check the pricing on Apple's website, but I think they may have increased the, uh, the storage options available for iCloud, which is obviously staring, storing all of your photos and videos on the internet, they may have increased the size options available. I know, I think one of them is one terabyte size, and I think it may only be ten dollars or so a month. Check Apple's website to be sure. Uh, but it was it, to me, it seems that they're trying to drive everything towards the cloud, and that makes sense from a marketing perspective because with Apple, most people don't just have the iPhone. They probably got an iPod Touch. They probably got a MacBook. They may have an iMac. They may have an iPad. They may have multiple iPads. And to have all those devices and be able to marry them together into one centralized storage location for photos and video, I think that's why I th that's why they may not make the size of the internal storage as much. It's the same with the desktops. This this MacBook right here, 
this only has 128 gigs flash. So it's, uh, it's not a lot of space, but what I do, I'm going to pull it over here. This is my field computer. So when I'm out in the field and I'm capturing videos, I do, uh, Hold on just a second. I'll get it out. So what I do, even with this device, I don't care about the... Uh, the internal storage because flash is going to give you greater speed than if you had a traditional hard drive because traditional hard drive has got the you know it's manual if you get the fusion which is a it's a mix between flash and traditional you get more storage space but you're introduced with the problem of the heat that the manual hard drive does and it's still not as fast as flash only so for that reason I go with with all my Macs I go with the minimal internal flash storage size. My iMac with Retina, it's the 256. That was the smallest they offered. So I've got 256 flash in it, but then I've got uh, 42 terabytes external uh, by way of Thunderbolt 2. On my MacBook Pro, I use this, and it's a bus-powered hard drive. So the advantage to it is that when I'm in the field, I don't have to carry another, I don't have to carry another power adapter. So I just plug this into my MacBook's USB 3.0 port and it powers itself off of the USB 3.0 and the other beauty of this especially if you use a Mac like I do for photo and video what I do when I go to a different filming location is that I create and check out my tutorial on this and in my post on snagbear.com which is my website by the way one of my websites and you'll find all the all the items there including this drive this laptop uh, but what it does it enables me to create a library for photos, which is the photo still photos application on the Mac, as well as a library for Final Cut Pro, which is where I put my videos. And I put it all on this drive and I organize it day by day. So when I'm at a filming location, day one, AX100, or day one, RX102 that I have over there, day one, Phantom 3. And I organize it in that way so that when I return to my studio, I just simply plug this hard drive into my iMac with Retina and then I send all of these projects over the photos and videos to uh, to my desktop Mac, and it copies them to the uh, to the Thunderbolt 2 external storage, which I also have a time machine backup of. So if any of my hard drives fail, I've got redundancy, so I've got a backup that I could restore those videos from. Now the photos I use iCloud now, so all my still photos are in iCloud, so I can pull open any device: my MacBook, iPod Touch, iPhone 6 Plus and I can access the same photos. And you can do and videos too, but my videos, my long duration videos, I still store those on external hard drive storage instead of the cloud. Okay, we got some more. Uh, cool, thanks, thanks for the support. This is just a, uh, this is a show for y'all. So, you know, think about Think about any questions you have coming up. I just want to make it a laid back, face on video, respond to comments, face on video type format. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing too formal. Someone says, uh, what's the advantage of Thunderbolt versus USB? Well, this is USB 3.0 which for me is plenty fast. I can edit directly in Final Cut Pro, even with 4K video with this device. Th with that said, Thunderbolt 2 is a little bit faster. And the advantage of Thunderbolt 2 is that you can daisy chain devices. So the enclosures I have, uh, the enclosures I currently have, they, they each have support for four serial ATA drives. So using the concatenated disk set that I use within Mac OS X, I can add a new physical drive and then expand that volume from where it is now, which is 22 terabytes. Say I added another six terabyte physical drive, I could expand it to uh, 28 terabytes without having to erase anything. And, and again, check out snagbear.com. I've got all the technical mumbo jumbo step-by-step -step there, uh, how I create the concatenated disk set, 
how I, uh, how I set up my external storage arrays. And that's my main advantage for Thunderbolt 2. It's not necessarily the speed because as I'd mentioned, the speed for USB 3.0 is fine for me, but it's just the flexibility of being able to daisy chain additional enclosures as my demand for storage increases. As someone says, do you let the, the Phantom cool down before battery swap and do you recalibrate the compass? And this is just my, this is how I do it. You know, obviously just determine what your own best practices are. Anytime that I travel more than say five miles, I will recalibrate in the field. And if I'm flying in the same field and I fly one battery and then I want to fly my next battery, I don't, uh, I, I don't calibrate again then, but I've never let the phantom cool down. And I, I know when I touch the, when I touch the motors after flying one battery for say 18, 20 minutes that they're very warm. So it'd probably be best practice to, uh, to let it cool down before flying the second battery. But I've done it. I've never flown more than two batteries in a row. And that's simply because I've only got two batteries at the time of posting this, but it would probably be best to let it cool down. Uh, could you turn your iPhone 6S personal hotspot, put it in your pocket and pair it with iPod on DJI controller? Uh, great question. Actually, several fans had commented about a similar scenario and they did it with, uh, they didn't use the iPod touch, but they used an iPad and it did work. So I'm assuming it would likely work for the, uh, for the iPod touch as well. Have I used any third party apps for the P3? I have not. And, that's simply because I, I really haven't, I'm sure there's some neat ones out there, but I just, I really haven't had the need. It's the, uh, the factory app for me has done everything that I've needed. But if there's some other apps out there, I may, I may explore those in, uh, within future videos, maybe some future field test videos. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Can you do some videos on the non DJI pilot apps? Uh, such as autopilot, etc. That's what I want to do. And how do I record the screen? Uh, well, actually, I've got a uh, I've got a video tutorial in the works uh, that I'll be that I'll be sharing soon with that information, and I'll I'll be posting a post on uh, on snagbear.com. By the way, I've got two websites: snagbear.com, which is kind of my across the board product review, product unboxing, and also drones. And then I've got four hundred. 400 or below.com, which is my source for everything drone. So you need a new Phantom 3, you need another drone brand, you need accessories, you need tutorials. You can find it all there on 400 or below. So that's my website. So anything, you got friends looking for drones, you're looking for a new drone, you're looking for new drone accessories. If you could check out 400 or below.com, I would appreciate it. And if you don't see it there, you know, shoot me a message on my Facebook fan page, shoot me a message on my website, irixguy.com. Uh, YouTube, et cetera, and I'll be able to do my best to find those product links for you. Uh, mostly Samsung devices. I've I've heard some people use them. I'm unfortunately I'm strictly Apple right now, so I haven't tried it. I can't speak from experience, but I do know a lot of people have had good luck with the Google Nexus tablet. Uh, what I used to edit my videos, Final Cut Pro 10 on an iMac with the Retina 5K display. Uh, check uh, check snagbear.com and I, I detail everything that I use for my video editing there. If you can't find the link on snagbear.com, shoot me a message after this on Facebook fan page, facebook.com forward slash irixguy, and I'll happily reply directly with a direct link to that. Got everything linked there you would need. Everything that I use for editing and storage, it's all there. Have you had issues with airlines while traveling with your DJI? Uh, I have not, but I do want to point out the, uh, the things that I've learned. Now, I did have a friend that was going, uh, he went to, I think it was Iceland, and he, he carried his Phantom own in a carry-on, which I would strongly not recommend not doing that because what happened to him, he was between the, uh, the destination and he stopped in an airport. He was in the terminal. And he was actually pulled aside by TSA in the terminal because he had a drone 
because he was flying with the drone as, as his carry-on, he was pulled into a room in question. So for that reason, that could potentially create travel delays. I wouldn't carry it on. From my experience, I've flown, I've flown all over the Caribbean, and then I've also flown to Canada. Uh, from my experience, what I found that I don't, out of good practice, and I don't know if this is an actual law or not, but I put the phantom batteries, I've got two batteries, I put them in my carry-on, but I always check the Phantom 3 Professional, and I've flown to my previous Phantoms, my Phantom 2 Vision Plus, and my Phantom 2 as well. I always check them in a waterproof case, and I put the TSA lock on there so that TSA can open it without a passcode or without a combination or a key. They've got a special key that they use, so they can open it, and then... Uh, but when it's in baggage claim, when you're waiting to pick it up, it better prevents strangers from opening your case while you're, you know, before you're, maybe you're delayed and you don't get to the baggage claim in time. It better prevents someone from opening your case and potentially stealing some or all of your uh, uh, personal belongings from it. So this case, uh, you can find it on 400orbelow.com. I would also suggest the, uh, the TSA lock not just because TSA can open it, but it also has an indicator so that if they do open it, it'll change color. So you'll know if, you're, uh, if your Phantom 3 case has been opened or your Phantom 2, whatever you're flying, when you hit your destination, that way if something's falling out, that you would know that, hey, you know, they were in there. I'm not going crazy. I, I put this in there before I left my hotel. Why is it not in there? And another good pointer is to uh, consolidate everything. You don't want you don't want loose stuff in here that could fall out. So for that reason, you know, just making sure what I usually do, I put it all in here and then I position it in a way to where I, I can open it up in my, in my studio and kind of tilt the case around and see if anything falls out. Because if it falls out for me, there's a good chance that a baggage handle or TSA or whatever that's been potentially touching thousand cases that day they're probably not going to handle it with cotton gloves like you would yourself, it being your own product. But I would always check it below. I have been, um, as far as encounters, there's been times internationally where I've, where I've been asked to open the case. There's been times where they said, hey man, what's in there? I said, it's a drone. And, and that was in the earlier drone days. And a lot of times they didn't know and they were really curious and I had to answer the questions. And, and then there were times, uh, there was one island that, that I had landed on and I made it through customs and, and I was getting ready to get to the, to the little duty free. They had a little duty free shop that you could buy liquor before you left the, uh, before you left the airport and it was cheaper. So I was walking in there and then, and then the TSA person came up and said, they said, Hey, Hey, wait just a minute. And, and this was actually, I was, uh, I was traveling with a, uh, with a YouTube, well, actually a real life friend of mine, and we were doing we were doing some YouTube videos, and we both had our drones. It was Phantom Two Vision Plus at that point in time, and they were really curious. And what's funny about these things when you open these cases, they do have a pressure release valve. So we had to put our cases up on this table in customs area, while while the TSA person standing right there in front of us. And when you start to open it, it started making a hiss, and you could see everybody around us getting paranoid and stuff. We're like, no, no, that's just. Uh, um, that's just the pressure release valve. So after we opened it, I think it was the first time they had seen a, they had seen a drone. It was more or less, it was more or less a, a conversation out of curiosity. And, and then they started talking to us about all these fish that they had caught the previous day off the, off the coast of that Island. So, you know, check it, <clears throat> check it. And if you do encounter anything, it's probably just going to be a series of questions, but again, check with the local regulations. And always, in my opinion, unless they change the regulation, put, put the batteries in your carry-on instead of checking them in the case because that's, that's because of a, uh, these could pose a potential fire hazard. So, I mean, just from a safety perspective, if, if that's permissible by the airlines when you travel, that's probably how I would continue to do it is carry those in my carry-on just to be safe. Uh, so, we've got a lot more questions here. Uh, flying over the conversation of people flying in, in areas that are questionable. 
Uh, my personal opinion, you can watch my drone evangelist video series. Just go to droneevangelist.com and you will hear that I preach drone safety because I feel that as, as responsible drone hobbyists, if we don't get out there and really spread responsible drone use in a non-confrontational and positive way, if we don't put the positivity out there from a, from a hobbyist perspective, this hobby is going to cease to exist at a worldwide level. So I think that all of these acts of, of stupidity, if we're not careful as a community, they're either going to disallow drones altogether or they're going to make the regulation so tight that it's, that it's no longer an enjoyable hobby. Oh, the follow me? No, the follow me works fine for my iPhone 6 Plus. It just doesn't work with my iPod Touch. And that's the only feature. And I've got to test waypoints today, but so far the uh, the follow me is the only feature that I had to use um, my cellular device with. So that's... Uh, Trying to think if there's anything else. That's it in a nutshell. So tell me what you think. Uh, you know, share this video with others. This video will become available offline after it finishes processing. So if you weren't able to watch this live and you've got friends that wanted to see this show, you'll have a link. Just go to go to my YouTube channel, my Facebook fan page. I'll post it there in a few hours. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash Irix guy. And you'll be able to share this with others. And you can still comment. Obviously, right now at the time of, of speaking, we're, we're still live, so I can see your comments and respond live. Someone says, what's up? What's up? How are y'all doing? See, I can see your comments live. <laughs> I have to go to, and we're going we're gonna to stick this to an hour, hour long uh, format, and I'll, I'll keep it. Does this time work well for everyone? This is, uh, this is the East Coast, the New York City time, typical lunch hour. It's at noon. New York City. So is this a good time? And, and do you like Thursday or maybe there's a better day during the week? I, I'm not going to do it on a Monday because I know Mondays are typically bad for people, uh, but maybe I'll stick it to uh, stick it to Thursdays. No, it, nobody's missed it. No, because this, this is going to be next week. So stay tuned. I'm going to go ahead after I upload this video and post the offline version to Facebook. I'm going to go ahead and schedule Irix Guys Live Show Episode 5 for the same time next week. So we'll do it uh, We'll do it at noon, New York City time, next Thursday, so a week from today. So be thinking of questions. Shoot me questions in advance if you want to on Facebook, YouTube. Send them my way, and uh, we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to talk about whatever everyone wants to talk about because that's what this show is all about. It doesn't just have to be drones. It can be video editing. It can be... Uh, uh, it can be entrepreneurship. It can be whatever you want to discuss. So I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the kind words. This was a this was a test of a new format, and I'm glad that uh, glad that everybody liked it. And I and I really appreciate the the participation. I mean, for during the week, at this time during the week, this is a this is a huge turnout. So this is great. Uh, share with others. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. YouTube.com forward slash Irix guy. Check out 400 or below.com. And uh, most importantly, y'all have a good day and uh, fly safely. See you later.